Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest, says the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus addressed this parable to them. What man among you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them would not leave the 99 in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy. Upon his arrival, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I found my lost sheep. I tell you, in just the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or what woman, having ten coins and losing one, will not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it? When she does find it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says to them, she calls and says to them, rejoice with me because I found the coin that I lost. Just the same way I tell you, there will be rejoicing among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Whenever you come to New Church, you always have to try to adjust the microphone to make sure that the people are able to hear the priest. There's a story of a um, new pastor that came in about 10 years ago before the, the liturgy was changed and he started off the Mass saying there's something wrong with the microphone the, be the people said and also with you. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't say that to me, okay? Those who are trained in homiletics, which is the art of preaching, know that when we preach, it's kind of like a Japanese buffet. You can choose so many different possibilities to preach on. So I'd like to give you a little, little taste of the, the, rich, the richness of the liturgy. Now, we can preach on the prayers in the Mass, too. So over the past year, I've been trying to do that because I just feel that the prayers that we say are so rich. And I'd like to take one word from the opening prayer that we're saying the whole week, and it's stumbling. Stumbling. I think all of us have had the misfortune of, of stumbling. And you get up in the morning and you're not, you're not aware that there's a shoe there and you stumble and you trip over the shoe or you, you, you stub your foot against the bedpost. Ever happened? No? 
We've all had that experience. No? A definition of sin is moral stumbling. If you like a kind of ad lib definition of, um, of sin. One of the most famous saints in the past hundred years is Saint Therese of Lisieux. We call her the little flower. She said this, uh, I am capable of committing the worst sins imaginable. This is the little flower. I am capable of committing the most heinous sins imaginable. And she said, the only reason why I did not, she only lived to be 24 years old, is because God cleared the path. I like that. I like that. We should make that prayer also. Actually, when we say, deliver us from evil, we're basically making that prayer in the Our Father. If you, if you, if you pray it sincerely. One of my favorite saints, it's when I said my first mass by myself. The first mass I actually said was with John Paul II. I kind of celebrated with him. Great privilege, huh? But the following Mass was on May 26, which is the feast day of St. Philip Neri, known as the Second Apostle of Rome. Philip Neri said this, Lord, place your hand on Philip, lest he betray you. Then when he became a priest, he said, Lord, place both of your arms in Philip. Same idea. And Philip Nero, when he's walking through the streets of Rome, he said, Ecco me senza la grazia di Dio. I don't know if any of you speak, speak Italian, no? There go I, save the grace of God. When he saw a bum on the street, there am I, save the grace of God. Okay, the essence of the first reading of St. Paul is his great love for Jesus Christ. There are many ways in which we can get to know and love Christ. A few minutes ago I just finished teaching a confirmation class in my parish. I happen to be uh, the teacher that has most classes, both children and adults. No? And um, last year I actually wrote out a confirmation book for the uh, confirmation students. And it's uh, very Christocentric. So the class that I taught today related to the first reading are 10 titles for Christ. This is a good way to really get to know Christ. Now let, let me give you a, a way to understand that. <clears throat> Most of you women here are Christians. You say, no, we're Catholic, we're Christians too. Christians, you're Catholics, your mothers, your spouses, your aunts, your nieces. Uh, those are about seven different titles for the same person of who you are. You can say the same thing about Jesus Christ. These are some of the titles 
that we could get to know for Jesus Christ. First, Jesus, which means Savior. And his venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen says, the most important title for Jesus is Savior. That exemplifies the his raison d'être, as you say in French, the, his reason for being or coming is he came to save us. Catechism of the Catholic Church commenting on the name of Jesus says that the name of Jesus is already a prayer. The name of Jesus is already a prayer. St. Paul says that the name of Jesus, every knee, in heaven, on earth, and below the earth, should bow. When I went to school, school uh, Catholic elementary school in New York, um, with the New York Dominicans in Nanuet, New York, they taught us, at the name of Jesus, always to bow your head. I don't know if they taught you in California or not. You who, you are of my vintage, you're a little bit older, you probably remember that the nuns taught us at the name of Jesus to bow your head. Because of the great reverence we should have for that name. The great reverence. Let me give you two other titles and make then a reference to the gospel. Another title is this. About 32 years ago, I arrived at my first destination in Buenos Aires. My first destination was in Argentina. And when I arrived, uh, my Italian was pretty darn good. My English is pretty good too. But my Spanish was almost non-existent. But I remember seeing a picture. It was a big picture of the Sacred Heart. And below, four words. Five, no? Jesus, el amigo que nunca falla. Habla español? Un poquito? Jesus, el amigo que nunca falla. I'll translate if you don't know Spanish, okay? Jesus is the friend that will never fail us. And I've loved that title ever since I read that. I really like that title. Where do we get that? John 13. There at the Last Supper, Jesus says, I don't call you servants, but I call you friends. Because you know what the Master is about. So I'd like to give you the last title related to the Gospel. Jesus is, he's the good shepherd. So we enter into Father Al Hall, who was a priest that was with us for about seven years, about 15 years ago. He calls this chapter that we started to read today, he calls it the, the lost and found chapter. the lost and found chapter. Because today you've got the lost sheep and the sheep that's found. You've got the lost coin and the coin that is found. And guess what you're going to be listening tomorrow. The most famous story in the history of the world. I won't tell you what it is, but you could probably guess what it's going to be. I won't tell you.
But today in the Gospel we have the story of the lost sheep, that the shepherd leaves the 99 and he goes after the lost sheep. Having been a city boy all my life, I've often thought about this. If I had a hundred sheep and one would look, one wander, I'd say, let him go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let him go. I got 99, right? But that's not the way the Lord thinks. I'd like to tell you a story about a lost sheep that was found. Years ago, when John Paul II was the reigning pontiff, there's a story of, uh, if you know ecclesiology, the bishops have to have a visit with the pope about every, about every three years, the visita ad limonorum. So there was a bishop in Rome. He was having um, breakfast, and he looked outside where he was having breakfast, and he saw someone in, on the street. And as he looked, he said, I know that, I know that guy. He was in the seminary with me. So he was a priest who became one of those homeless people on the streets of Rome. So the bishop draws close, and he starts to enter in conversation, said, you were in the seminary with me. You were a priest here in Rome. What happened? He said, well, I um, fell out of grace, and I'm no longer exercising my priesthood. I'm just one of these homeless men in the streets of Rome. So they talked for a few minutes, and then once he finished, the, the bishop went for his meeting with John Paul II. John Paul II received him very courteously, but the bishop couldn't get that encounter with his with his friend out of his mind and told John Paul II about this renegade priest that has given up his priest and is one of those homeless men in the streets of Rome. John Paul II said, stop, you go and you look for him and bring him here. I want to talk with him. And the bishop said, how can I do that? No, Rome is like LA, it's like Buenos Aires, it's like Paris, it's a huge city. I lived there for many years. John Paul II said, obey. So he got up and he started to look for this guy. And after a long search, he found him in one of the alleys there, sitting there in the gutter. And he bends over and says, you know, I've got some news for you. What's that? Someone wants to talk with you. Who's that? John Paul II. Ah. I said, I'm really in trouble now, huh? So he takes this priest with him. And when he arrived, John Paul II is waiting for them, and he's got a banquet prepared for them, like the prodigal son. They sit down, and they start to talk, and to eat, and to laugh, and tell stories, and to joke, and they just, they're shooting the breeze, and they're just having a lot of fun. After the meal, John Paul II says to this, this priest, can you do me a favor? Of course, Your Holiness, you're the Pope. I obey. There's a, an adjacent room. I'd like you to go with me and we could just talk a little bit. Of course. So the two leave the, the bishop and they go into an adjacent room. And all of a sudden, John Paul II tells the priest to, to have a seat. And all of a sudden, John Paul II he falls down to his knees and says, could you hear my confession? He said, what did you say? Can you hear my confession? You're a priest. I'm a sinner. I want you to hear my confession. So John Paul II, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, opens up and makes his confession to this wandering sheep in the streets of Rome. 
And the priest says, Your Holiness, I absolve you for sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Then, the priest says, Your Holiness, can you do me a favor? Of course. Can you hear my confession? So he opens up his heart and he unloads and he confesses all of his sins to the Good Shepherd of the Catholic Church. And John Paul II gives him absolution in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Shortly after that, John Paul II restored him to priestly ministry in one parish in Rome that works with the homeless people of the city. For me, that's the most beautiful modern rendition of the parable of the lost sheep, of the parable that you're going to be listening tomorrow, the parable of the prodigal son that we can call really the parable of the merciful father. Amen.